we used to do a lot of visiting every year. We would go back and forth between our families. I would be the host one year and somebody else would be the next and so forth. Um, we have stopped. I stopped doing that about a year ago, I guess. Yeah. Um, I knew that I was reaching a point that I couldn't. I may take longer to process information in order to make a decision or to determine which direction I'm going to go um, and or what subject matter I'm going to bring up with Margaret about what we need to talk about. So uh, that's been the, the one thing that uh, uh, I have seen occur. And sometimes he needs prompting to get him started on a particular task. Um, which is very different uh, from before. Uh, knowing where things are in the house has become a challenge because he'll forget, for instance, the dishes. He may forget, oh, the glasses are in that cabinet, but the plates are in the other cabinet. So I see that that has prog progressed. I see that happening where he may open a couple of cabinets to get to what he wants. I find myself sometimes getting too too much in a hurry, and then then I start like uh, not not being able to to to, uh, to stay stay with it. In other words, uh, the uh, for, for forgetfulness is is there. Uh, but then I under, I've talked to others and read stories of others who seem to be much worse than I am, you know, when it comes to this area. The whole family has had to join in with a checklist of do you have all those things? Because the more emotional Steve gets, the more his dementia-like qualities are pronounced. Early on, he enjoyed walking a lot. Matter of fact, he would walk faster than me. So I would be running to keep up with him. He he, he loved to walk. Uh, he loved children. And now he basically wants to either watch TV or hear music playing. Um, he now don't want to get involved in activities uh, like the coloring. That's something that I kind of have him focused on doing that rather than just sit all day. Let's see. We used to be very, very, and I'm going to say used to because that's the way our life is. Used to be very, very involved in the community, in uh, kids' sports, in church. We taught Sunday school. We went on mission trips. We just did it all. Our house was open to one and all. And, um, you know, gradually over these years, that has disappeared. That's one of the things I regret as my condition goes on. I, I, I can't uh, go to like my granddaughter's volleyball games, softball games, and things like that, which with my two boys, I always attended everything they ever did. But I, I regret that I can't do that now with my granddaughters. But from a day-to-day -day basis, I have a routine set up that Kathy and I have uh, developed, I guess you'd say, that uh, I work out pretty good, but that wasn't always the case. It took a while to get to where I could deal with day-to-day -day life like I do now. I quit my job. I, this is something that needs to be brought up to the world. This hurts one very much financially. Well, the challenge is, of course, is the dementia itself and that I don't know, I may be perfectly fine when I get up. Well, I seem that I'm fine. And then all of a sudden I might start seeing colors. I might hallucinate about something running around the wall. Ah. Uh, all those things uh, happen to me at times, and I see little men with sharp, pointy teeth runs at me sometimes. And, you know, 
and it's very real when it happens. But then when I get away from that, so to speak, then I realize that it's my mind working on me and it's not real. But at the time, it's always very real. Now he does not want to go anywhere because he never knows when those hallucinations are going to hit. He never knows when his behavior might act out. And he does not want people out in the world to know that or see that or react to that. It's scary at times. And uh, I get frustrated at times because uh, of the way things happen in my mind. Because for no reason at all, I might be uh, watching television and I call it my head going hollow. It's like there's no reason, nothing in my head. I can't think. I am just there. My head, I call it going electric. It's like if you can imagine looking in a kaleidoscope and just seeing colors of all dimensions swirling around, that's the way my head does. And just the uncertainty of uh, the way things happen is the most frustrating thing to me because I just don't know from day to day what I may encounter. We've really, really, really had to adjust our entire lifestyle to get to the point where we are now and acceptance of what it is in this situation, because we can't go places with people. We're not in their world. You know, we can't go camping. We don't go out to restaurants. We don't do all the things that people of our age do. And there we are there we are. I mean, we're basically alone unless someone comes to see us. The reason I can't do that is because of emotional overload, I call it. Noise, as Kathy said earlier, bothers me. Uh, rapid movements, and people running around and doing this, that, and the other bother me. And so mm -hmm. I can't deal with things like I once did. I have no sympathy, no empathy, no social graces. Um, I've gotten myself you know, in trouble a couple of times saying things or, or from not caring. And that's one of the, I guess, one of the things that is deep is we don't care what we say or what we do sometimes. The filter is gone. So it's uh, it can be difficult in social situations when you don't have a filter and he can't stop it. Uh, no one can stop it. Sometimes when he loses his temper, he'll say, I know it's coming, but I can't stop it. I can't drive. Um, I no longer have a driver's license. Um, I go from day to day. Some days all I want to do is sit and read um, other days, I don't want to do anything but maybe watch a little TV or sleep, and it's really affected my sleep. I don't sleep that well at night some nights, but I'll sleep all day. Sharon can tell you that I used to read uh, books, and you could ask me years later about the book, and I could tell you almost word for word the storyline. Uh, now, I'll read a book. Next week, I'll pick it up and I'll look at it. I won't know if I read that book or not. So it's my short term memory is tending to go uh, flaky. Uh, but yeah, I've still got my long term memory. So for Rod, he's sort of mid. We're having some word issues, some understanding issues. There are good days and bad days. As you see progression, it uh, it changes. You know, the, the disease changes as we go along. There's no um, uh, intimacy, unfortunately. Um, you know, do, we, we sleep in separate beds, mainly because I popped her in the head a couple of times thrashing during the night. Rod has an issue in crowds, and uh, there's a lot of anxiety when there's a crowd. So some of the activities that we used to do are not able to be done any longer because of 
there being a crowd. People with frontotemporal dementia especially do not look look like they have dementia, whatever that is. And they don't, and people don't feel as though they act like they have dementia. So there's a stigma about what dementia is in communities. And if people would just be more aware and know what dementia means and that it is a, a disease, it's, it isn't the person wanting to be a, a jerk. They're, they just have a disease and that disease takes over sometimes. FTD, because of the age of onset, uh, the normal age of onset is usually between 45 and 65. But as I said, some can be much younger and have small children at home. The cost of FTD is twice that of Alzheimer's. Uh, the studies show that Alzheimer's can cost a family up to $60,000 a year. Uh, FTD is 120000 a year. And the reason for that is people lose their jobs in the prime your earning years. So if you're 50 years old, you're in the prime of your career and you now have to stop working or they fire you, which is usually what happens. And uh, you lose all your benefits and everything. So it's a very costly, dementia is a very costly disease.